Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Pleasure having you here today. And a pleasure having Maya and Laurie with us. I'm Benjamin. I work for the innovation team in the Development Impact Group together with Bernardo and Malika. And since a few months with Laurie and Maya, who will be very privileged to have working with our team one day a week on a pro bono basis. Maya Shankar heads the White House Science and Behavior team and has an impressive background, but I'll let you introduce yourself, Maya. Don't, don't know why I need it. It's my <laughs> impressive background. <laughs> That's true. You have been probably the least bragging person I ever met. <laughs> and Laurie works as a senior advisor also in the White House Science and Behavior team and is a professor at the University of North Carolina. I'm not going to go long into your CV because you shared your CVs. Before we start with a presentation on the work of Laurie and Maya in the White House on what is behavioral insights and what are we cooking up together for you in the team to insert a behavioral insights lens into some of our initiatives, we'll do a quick round of introductions and then we'll hand over to Laurie and Maya. For the introductions, it would be amazing if you could just say your name, organization, and where in the organization you work, so what's your thematic area of focus? Okay, and shall we start? Do you know to? Me? Okay, yeah. my name is Naoto Yamamoto. I'm from UNDP technology team. Oh, okay. sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Raquel. I'm an intern with the Innovation Facility. And I forgot to mention we work with Bernardo, Malika, and Raquel. <laughs> Amazing colleagues, sorry. I'm Stan. I'm from RBAP Directorate working on communications. I'm Fatima. I work as the communications analyst uh, in the UNDP country office in Pakistan, and I'm here on a detailed assignment for three weeks for the communications. Team. I am Dora Gallardo. I work for UNDP on the marketing and outreach team. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Chantal Robia. I'm a lawyer, but I'm currently working with procurement writing policy. Hi, my name is Volker. I'm working in procurement, and my special focus of interest is behavioral change with regard to climate change. Uh, my name is Paul. I work at uh, UNDP Communications and Marketing Outreach. Sure, I'm Christine Chan. I work at the New Deal facility in the Strategic Policy Unit. I'm Nika Saini, UNDP Governance and Peace Building Policy. Hi, my name is Joseph, intern with the UNDP OHR. Hi, my name is Shivani. I work on the Human Development Report and the research team. And my background is in microeconomics. And I've been thinking about how people make decisions and uh, behavioral aspects of that for a while now. Hi, I'm Natalia Lino. I'm uh, temporarily chief of staff of BPPS, but I'm in the health team working with Charlie, uh, with UNDP and the Information Technology. Now, Bernardo with the Knowledge and Innovation Act and Charlie. Chris Mogadro with UNDP, Governance and Peace Building, focusing on Goal 16 in the SDG framework. Alika with the Innovation Facility. Claudia Binay, the Gender Team, uh, Women's Economic Empowerment. Lucia Pia, I work also in Gender Team. I have been working with the UNDP Extended Relations on Private Sector Partnerships. Javier Sarredo, Regional Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean, Advisor on Seas and Security and Democratic Governance. And Javier Pacheco, Regional Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean, Strategic Advisor. Thank you. Then, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we will occasionally say hello. I don't think we can see you. I think you need to be like. Right here. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> to the folks online. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we're very excited to share some background on behavioral science insights and in particular the, the emerging role that it's been playing at UNDP. Um, and to also highlight sort of the portfolio of projects that we put together with roughly eight country offices around the world. Um, I just wanted to share one thing before we begin, which is this morning, uh, Ben and I were briefing uh, Monty about uh, why it is that Lori and I gravitated toward U towards UNDP um, as an agency that we thought was 
most amenable to using these insights in order to improve outcomes. And so, of course, I shared um, sort of the advanced state of affairs when it comes to evaluation and um, having an innovative mindset, especially with the innovation team. But I also mentioned that there is a lot of importance in finding individuals within the agency that are very excited about adopting these approaches. And that is Ben and Malika, who have been absolute all-star teammates um, from day one in this process and have really taken the reins with me as we've tried to identify uh, the relevant intersections. So I just wanted to also say thank you to both of you. Um, so much of what you see today is because of their hard work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we feel very humbled working with them. So. Uh, so I thought we'd begin just with a little bit of background on um, behavioral science, and I thought we'd take a very short trip uh, to Busia, which is in western Kenya. So in Kenya, researchers are interested in figuring out how to get farmers to invest more in fertilizer, because we know that fertilizer is responsible for increased agricultural prosperity, um, and we see a mismatch between people's intentions in using fertilizer and their actual usage. So when asked, farmers, I think roughly 98% of farmers say, oh yes, absolutely, I want to use fertilizer. But then when planting season actually arrives, a very small number of them, roughly 34%, actually end up using the fertilizer. So this is a question that really excites behavioral scientists. It's what is responsible for the mismatch between people's stated intentions, what they hope to do, and then what they actually end up doing. So, sorry, is there a, there's no clicker, right? Yeah, I just sorry. keep walking, walk, here, why don't I stay on this side? <laughs> that way it'll be a little more efficient. Um, so to summarize, we see less than one third of farmers using modern fertilizers despite the fact that 98% intend to use them. And we're trying to identify what is responsible for the mismatch between people's intentions and then their actions. So we use what Lori and I would call a behavioral design map, where we are defining the problem, diagnosing what the potential sources of error or uh, the barriers are. We're designing an intervention that leverages insights from behavioral science to help us solve that problem. And then we're testing the intervention using rigorous evaluation methods because it's important for us to figure out what's working and what isn't working so that we know what we should actually be bringing to scale and what we should be improving. So in the case of the farmers, we were able to clearly define the problem. Not enough farmers are using fertilizer. The diagnosis, maybe it's a mismatch in timing. So one issue that we face is, or that farmers are facing, is that they're flush with cash at the end of planting season. But there's about a four month lag between the end of, end of planting season when they're flush with cash and when they actually have the opportunity to invest in fertilizer four months later. So you can imagine, like most people, when you're flush with cash, people, family, relatives will ask you for some of that money, so that you might be giving them loans, uh, you might be uh, sort of susceptible to spending the money uh, before you kind of c consider your long-term goals or needs. And so what happens is that by the time planting season comes around and they have the opportunity to buy fertilizer, they're no longer flush with cash. So how do we align the timing between when farmers are actually getting access to all of these resources, these financial resources, and when they can invest in fertilizer? There's another issue here, which is hassle factor. People have to go and actually locate fertilizer, go out of their way, find time in their busy schedules, um, and figure out how exactly to get it delivered to their farm. So we've diagnosed sort of two issues here. And now for the design. How do we encourage farmers to buy for fertilizer when they are actually flush with cash? remove hassles. Um, so there's two things that we've done that the researchers have done when it comes to designing the intervention. The first is um, to offer the opportunity to farmers to actually purchase fertilizer when they are flush with cash. So you can imagine this is like buying a voucher um, that you can then use later. So we go, so individuals will go around and ask different farmers, hey Lori, we know that you've just finished planting season. Are you interested in buying a voucher that you can then use four months from now? And hey, here's a benefit. We're actually going to deliver fertilizer free of charge to you at that moment in time so that you don't even have to go to the store. And then we test the impact using a randomized control trial. What we find is pretty profound. There's a significant boost in farmers using fertilizer as a result of this intervention. And one thing that I find really compelling is that when you compare the impact of this very low-cost behavioral nudge to actually just offering a 50% subsidy 
on the fertilizer. So using classical economics to help determine the most effective way forward, you actually find a much bigger impact in the behavioral intervention. And so this is a nice way of challenging sort of classical assumptions of what motivates people and using other factors other than financial incentives to motivate people towards the actions of interest. We're also trying to use these insights in Mozambique right now with farmers using mobile money. So farmers can now download a mobile app in which they can actually reserve some of their money. So it links to their bank account and they can make these kinds of investments up front so that from a mental accounting perspective, the money is sort of bucketed over to the side and it's no longer um, available for other sorts of um, purchases. So as I was saying, um, there's the standard model of behavior where we're all eating salads um, mm -hmm. and uh, where we are logical, rational, <laughs> we weigh costs against benefits, um, we have excellent self-regulation um, in pursuit of our long-term goals, and we're unaffected by bodily <laughs> states and feelings. But we know from our experience that our actual behavior can depart quite significantly from this rational <laughs> model and that we look a little bit more like this, um, where we're myopic, impulsive, driven by social desires, our poor planners, where you can tell by his eyes that he's sort of gravitating towards the chocolate cake. Um, and so it's hard for us in these instances to always exert sort of long-term um, planning into our decision-making and into our mindsets. So then our goal is to design policies and programs, especially in a UNDP context, that take the mind into account, that take our behavioral biases into account so that when we know people are prone to things like um, being myo myopic or weighting um, pro low probabilities uh, with greater magnitude than they deserve or preferentially choosing short-term gains versus longer-term gains, we're actually cleverly designing these policies to take those behavioral biases into account so that they can better serve people. And this is particularly true when physical resources are limited and when mental resources are limited. This is because when you're busy juggling mental resources, we don't have the mental bandwidth to think through complex problems, like um, how it is that we should navigate an application form in order to get X benefit, or how it is that we should remember things or exert, exert self-control in real time so that we help to ensure our long-term health. And so our goal is to design policies that empower people under these constraints to make the same decisions they make if they had more mental bandwidth. So it's still an alignment with people's actual interests and actual long-term goals. It's just that we're helping to streamline that process so that in the face of a lot of competing demands, they're still making the best choices for themselves. So today I was hoping that we could walk through um, four different features of the behavioral insights framework. This is obviously a pretty simplistic model of behavioral science. There's obviously so many different insights that Lori and I call upon in our day-to-day -day lives, but we figure to use our own insights to generate activity that having something quick that you can remember will help you identify intersections between this work and your project portfolios. So the first is to make it easy for people to achieve their goals. Um, we often underestimate just how much small friction costs can impact people's willingness to actually go through the relevant steps to get access to a program or to sign up for, some, for something. In the U.S. context, we found this um, to have pretty stark effects in the area of financial aid. So the government offers low-income students financial aid to help them get to college, um, but what we found from research is that a really burdensome application process not only was a hassle to students, it actually led some students to delay or forego going to college altogether. Right, and that's, that's really significant because what that shows us is that what we thought was just a barrier or a, a hassle factor or friction cost is actually making the dis difference between a kid going to college or not going to college. And so those same researchers streamline the process by offering to families the option of pre-populating the forms using existing tax data and also offering them the opportunity um, to get assistance on the phone from a uh, tax specialist to help fill it out, and they found an eight percentage point increase in, in not only um, completion of the form, but actual enrollment in college. And so that's an example of the importance of making it easy for people to access the things for which they're eligible. A second is the importance of making things attractive. Now, in some cases, this is about making things salient. So when you're sending a letter in the mail, you want to make it very visually attractive. But I don't necessarily mean attractive in the sense of adding like sequence and sparkles to the letters that go out. 
oftentimes what can be most attractive to people is simplicity. And this is because we're inundated with so much incoming information that actually having straightforward messages or action steps can get you the most bang for your buck. So when I review in, in my White House job all of these government forms, I mean, there's just so much prose. And sometimes it can take you four pet paragraphs down to even figure out what the heck you're even being asked to do. So in this particular case, attractive would be pulling the punt, like the bottom line up front from that fourth paragraph to the top of the form. So that, so that readers know immediately what it is that they're being asked. The third is to motivate people through other people's behaviors. So we are all very social creatures, and we're highly motivated by how those around us behave. And so one behavioral tactic is to articulate norms in your community or uh, behaviors that people just like you engage in as a way to motivate people to engage in those same behaviors. And then finally, it's to make things relevant at key moments and decision points. So this was exemplified by the example I talked about with farmers, where offering the opportunity for them to invest in fertilizer at the same time that they're flush with cash uh, can actually get more people using, more farmers using fertilizer down the line. So what I thought is I would just walk through one quick example um, of each of these uh, four categories, and then I'll pass the baton over to Lori, who will talk about how we're leveraging some of these insights in a UNDP context, and then we'll open it up for questions. So the first example um, has to do with reducing um, child mortality in Kenya. So every year, 2 million children are dying of diarrheal disease every year. And these numbers could be greatly reduced simply by having people chlorinate their waters. However, in areas without piped water infrastructure, common practice is to sell chlorine to people at stores. But this is associated with packaging and distribution costs. It's associated with requiring that people be proactive, that they identify that moment in their day when they, they can actually go to the store. And also with measurement errors, where you think you know roughly how much chlorine you need, but it does require um, sort of precise measuring in order to get the exact quantity that you need for the amount of water that you previously purchased. So re researchers thought to themselves, well, in order to make it as easy as possible for people to use chlorine, why don't we install these chlorine dispensers in the same location that people are already going to when they're purchasing their water in the first place? Selling chlorine at communal water sources would not only be less expensive for people, but it can be easily integrated into people's existing routines. So you're at the water um, facility, you have a big jug, it's actually dispensing water for you, and then right next to it, you can go, and then the way that they've set it up is to have a machine dispense the precise amount of chlorine that you need, given the amount of water that you just purchased. And what they find in this case is a 53% increase in not only the purchasing of chlorine, but in the presence of chlorine in people's water as a result of these changes. And now, based on the fact that this is a randomized control trial and researchers could show that it was the presence of the chlorine at the water dispensers that was causally responsible for the 53% increase in chlorine in people's water, this intervention is now being scaled up to countries around the world and has the potential to save the lives of up to 250,000 children every year. So that's a great example of a pilot test generating a very promising result and then other policymakers and researchers being interested in adopting these insights. A second example comes from uh, South Africa and efforts to um, actually promote loan take up. So as I mentioned, when we talk about making things attractive, we often think about catchy incentives and appealing advertisements. And while these can be effective, what can be equally attractive to the human mind is simplicity. This is because we are, as I mentioned, constantly inundated with information and large menus of options that can create feelings of conflict and indecision, and which can actually demotivate people from acting. So I see this a lot in the US government context around student loans. A student loan borrower has access to so many different plans, all of which are named kind of similarly. And so what ends up happening is when the choice becomes so difficult, you actually find that people disengage from the process. And then they might just not end up signing up for any student loan plan, or it might just end up in the default plan, which might not be best suited for them. So we want to make sure that we are simplifying people's choice sets and making it an attractive choice um, in order to motivate action. So in this intervention, research showed that limiting the number of examples of loan options on a mailer significantly increases uptake, as much as reducing charged interest rates by 2.3%. So this is what the original mailer looked like. 
they made one change, which was to just give a concrete example. And they found, like I said, um, a significant uh, increase in loan take-up. Another one, I'm sure this is one that you guys have heard about, it's in the energy context, which is figuring out how to fight global warming. And these insights have been adopted in the US as well, which is to leverage social norms. So simply telling people how their energy usage compared to that of their neighbors. So saying, Maya, we just want to let you know that people who have similar house profiles as you have and have the same number of kids and have the same number of rooms are on average using less energy than you're using. And that um, can be very motivating for me because who wants to lose that on the competition of energy usage, right? Um, and so you find that individuals, more so than getting financial incentives or tax breaks, end up using less energy just so that they can um, sort of meet the bar relative to their peers. And an interesting feature of this intervention is you might ask the question, well, what happens to those people who are actually using less energy than their neighbors? What happens when they find out that they're using less? Do they just recklessly go around turning all the lights on, leaving stoves on just to sort of normalize? And so what they do in these interventions is to use what's called an injunctive norm. This is an absolute assessment of your energy usage. So people who are using less than their neighbors will get a smiley face or a grade of an A on the mailer as a way to prevent that boomerang effect um, and to make sure that they are getting an absolute assessment of the fact that they're actually doing really well and should keep it up. Finally, um, there's an insight around motivating concrete action at optimal times. So this is an, a case of trying to reduce um, HIV, uh, sorry, trying to increase HIV positive and TB patients to take medications and to show up for doctor's appointments. Um, so one of the biggest issues that we face in health is adherence. Adherence to really exhausting medication regimens, adherence to doctor's appointments, and these can, things can be lifesavers for the individuals who are afflicted with different diseases. And so one way that, we, that behavioral research is shown to be effective is to actually send very timely SMS reminders to individuals um, that actually motivate them to take proactive steps. So I might send Ben a text message and say, Ben, just a reminder, and you send it the day before, um, just a reminder that you are due for your doctor's appointment tomorrow at 10 a.m. And we, are, we now are, we've just gotten data back from Mozambique, but we're going to be evaluating the data to see whether these text message reminders are effective. And more importantly, we're going to figure out what kinds of messages are most effective and also this, the uh, timeliness with which you're supposed to be sending these messages. So there's some research showing that if you send them too frequent, frequently, they actually lose their saliency and they lose their appeal and you just see it as junk mail. If you send them too infrequently, people end up missing their doctor's appointments or not taking their medications on time. So one of the things we're interested to test is sort of the temporal sequence in which you, be, you should be sending these messages in order for them to have optimal impact. And now, Lori, <laughs> uh, would you like to talk a bit about our work at UNDP? Yeah, yeah. so um, and feel free to jump in with any questions or comments, of course, along the way. Um, Maya and I wanted to talk a little bit about the process by which we provide uh, behavioral insight support and then give some examples of the types of work that we're engaging with at UNDP. So first of all, um, the process, and you'll have picked up on some of this uh, listening to Maya's examples. Basically what we do is when we're embarking on an initial behavioral sciences project, um, or considering one, is we sit down with the pro prospective project partner and we talk a lot about the issue that they care about the most to try to really get a good sense of um, what problem they're trying to solve. Because you all um, are the content domain experts, you know, that can really fill us in on the day-to-day -day, um, decision making and processes and priorities that you're working with. So we talk a lot about that and we also talk about, you know, what kinds of data you might have available. Um, if we want to test the addition of behavioral insights. Um, and what you'll have noticed when we provide that support, when you think about the examples that Maya gave, is we provide support in a few different ways. One is um, conceptually. So once we have a good understanding of the problem at hand, then we think about like what concepts from the social and behavioral sciences can we draw from to apply to this problem. And the cool thing about the way that um, the team, for instance, in Washington works and the way that we've been working here is that it's very multidisciplinary. So it's drawing from economists' knowledge base, it's drawing from psychology, it's drawing from political science, and other social and behavioral sciences, so that depending on the problem at hand, we can pick out the best tools that are available and the best insight that we can apply to that problem at hand. So using that conceptual, theoretical, research, scientific, peer-reviewed knowledge base and what we've gleaned 
from years of research in these disciplines and applying it to that particular problem. Secondly, we use the methodology, you know, from the social and behavioral sciences. And oftentimes that is a randomized control trial. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's um, a quasi-experimental design. Um, and sometimes um, we provide insights and it's simply not testable if the data aren't available. So we sort of look to see, you know, what's possible within the constraints of that problem at hand. And then we come up with a methodology um, that suits that problem best. Finally, um, analytically, you know, once if it is a randomized control trial or a quasi-experimental design, um, applying the appropriate statistics that match up with that design to come up with an answer to the problem. One example that I'll give you from the White House Social and Behavioral Sciences team context, and then I'll move it over to the works in progress at UNDP. Um, this example, first of all, comes from the knowledge base, um, primarily within psychology. So I'll describe that um, bit of knowledge, that insight first, and then tell you how it was applied in the federal context. Thinking about um, one specific example, there was this research study that was conducted a while back in social psychology that was looking at the notion that people's attitudes, what they say they'll do, um, even if they really, really mean it, doesn't always match up with what they'll actually do when you put them in the situation. And you've seen that with some of the examples that Maya gave uh, just a few minutes ago. So in this, this was a laboratory study that um, really cleanly demonstrated the phenomenon. Basically, they gave people a pretty mild hypothetical scenario. They said, imagine that we invited you in to participate in this research study, and we gave you a choice. You could either have a really fun and interesting and engaging task that you could work on the whole time you're in here, or you could have this really dull, boring, you know, mind-numbing task to work on. And it's you and another person, and suppose you got to pick. Would you pick the good one for yourself, you know, and give the not so good one to her? Or what would you do? And hypothetically, people were like, no, you know, of course, I, would, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that to Maya, you know, give her the bad task. No. Afterwards, they actually put people in the situation, and they found, as you can imagine, that the vast majority of people actually picked the good task for themselves. Well, they looked at this and they said, okay, on the one hand, yeah, what people say and what they do doesn't necessarily match up, but maybe that's a little unfair because otherwise you're sort of just asking people to, you know, choose against their own interests. So they said, let's let's redo this study. And this time, let's ask people, you know, if you want, uh, we'll give you a coin and you can flip a coin to decide. Um, so everybody said, yeah, that's a, you know, that's a good idea. It's a little more comfortable. And they said, here you go. Go in another room, you know, flip the coin, come up, let us know how it went. And so the individual went in another room, flipped the coin to decide who got the fun and interesting task. And in that case, what percentage of the participants do you think got the fun and interesting task? 50%. Way more than 50%, like way, way more. Uh, maybe like 85, 90%, something like that. Because they were maybe flipping the coin, but they were still essentially picking the good task for themselves. Um, the final iteration of this experiment, they said, okay, what we know from psychology, and here's the insight, is that sometimes if you can make somebody's identity really salient, and if you can get them kind of thinking about themselves, like who they are, then many times we know from a lot of different research studies in many different contexts that they'll begin to behave in ways that line up more closely with their values. So the final iteration, they put just a little mirror, because they thought, you know, what can we do to make somebody's identity stuff salient? And sometimes in experiments, they'll ask people to listen to their heartbeat, Sometimes they will show them a picture of themselves. In this case, they just a little mirror that was in, in the other room when they flipped the coin. And in this case, people came out as a fair to coin toss, and about 50% of the people got the good and interesting um, task. That's the insight that sometimes, in the right circumstances, making somebody's identity salient will help and enable them to behave in ways that are more lined up with their attitudes. So now fast forward many years, and we're working in the federal government context, and we come up with this problem, and I know many of you are working on projects related to corruption or, or other types of issues. Um, this particular project was centered around a problem that was called the industrial funding fee. And the issue was basically when vendors sell to the federal government on a regular basis, they have to report how much their sales were. And the reason why they have to report how much their sales were is because they get taxed essentially on the basis of that amount of sales. So the more they sold, um, the more they have to pay in taxes, for lack of a better word. Um, and the standard form was like many government forms you see. So you log online, here's the form, you fill it out, report how much you sold to the federal government, and then at the bottom of the form, you attest that you know what you just reported was true. 
they had reason to believe that people were under reporting, um, you know, not reporting as much as um, they were really selling so that they weren't paying as much as they should have. In this particular case, uh, we thought, well, what if, you know, we kind of flipped that around a little bit and instead of asking people at the bottom to sign their name, kind of made that identity more salient right up front. So for half of the forms, move that signature box up to the top. And people were, and this is the important part of this particular study, randomly shunted to one version versus the other when they logged on. That enabled us to test to see whether or not the sales were higher in one version than the other, and in fact, they were. So just a very concrete example of how you can take sort of this research knowledge base, in this case from social psychology, apply it to a real-world problem, use the methods to test it, and hopefully, you know, solve and address some of the challenges or nudge behavior in a certain way. And that, that, that one led in three in a three month period to 1.6 million dollars in additional fees. And so if we were to scale that up to the entire population over the course of a year, that's 10 million dollars of additional revenue for the federal government at basically no cost. And you can think about the other types of methods that people would traditionally use. We should have more audits. We should have more people um, on the phones making sure that these vendors are accurate, all of which are extremely costly. So this is sort of a clever way of getting at the results we're after but in this very light touch, uh, low cost intervention. Exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, that, that kind of provides an example of the same sort of a model that we're using when we're working with UNDP. And uh, thanks to Malika and Ben, uh, we have been connected with some amazing people across the world who are already, you know, thinking along these lines and applying behavioral insights to the work that they're doing. In China and Moldova, Montenegro, Bangladesh, Ecuador, Papua New Guinea, and Cameroon. Um, we, we talked to folks um, in a variety of places. And we followed that sort of model that I was describing earlier. So phone calls and, and you know, talking this through and trying to figure out what the priorities were in each of those cases. Um, for example, um, in, I'll say Bangladesh, um, that was a really interesting one where they were interested in traffic congestion and um, reducing carbon emissions. And they were thinking, you know, what can we do about this? And one of the approaches that they were taking is if we can encourage more people to ride the bus, you know, and reduce the number of cars that we see on the road. And so through a series of conversations, we've been talking about how to design a randomized control trial, potentially, to encourage people to use a new app that they've developed. So they have already looked at this from a behavioral standpoint. They said, you know, what is it that's discouraging people from riding the bus? And we can think of a number of different ones. And they did some very good groundwork that identified several behavioral bottlenecks that were discouraging bus ridership. One of them was the unpredictability of, you know, when the bus is coming, how long is the journey, is the journey going to take? And, you know, Maya talked about some of those concepts before, those hassle factors, right? Whereas if you take a car, you know exactly when it's good, you're going to get in it, and you, you know, kind of can have a sense of how it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's not in Bangladesh. Yeah. You don't have to worry about, about seats arriving. being open. Like, there's a lot of Those yeah. kinds of things, you know. And so they thought at least maybe we can provide some information to people through a mobile phone app, then, you know, maybe we can make that a bit easier. So they've done that groundwork. And now the question is, how do we engage people in using this app, right? How do we get them on board to try it out and things like that? So we're talking um, with our colleagues there about potentially different messaging studies. So are there text messages framed in a certain way mm -hmm. using behavioral insights to actually make this option more attractive and encourage people to give this a try and you can see what they think. One small example. What I'll also mention, uh, we've got, let's see, um, China. Maya, you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, so in China, there's an e-waste recycling initiative where when people are done using their refrigerators or their microwaves or computers, there's an option for um, an e-recycler to come to your doorstep, pick up those goods, and then send them into a very efficient recycling process whereby those products can then be uh, sort of reinvented into new uh, products that can then be sold on the market. Similar to the um, uh, issue Lori was describing with the bus app, we see very low take up of this process. And oftentimes when you hear about low take up of a program, one might think it's revealing of a lack of interest by the general population actually taking advantage of it. But with, then when you dig a little bit deeper, you actually find that there's other factors at play, like lack of awareness of the fact that this program even exists, or uncertainty about how to get signed up, or not understanding when you're on the website 
how to exactly use it so that you can make sure that your goods are picked up. So the project that we're developing with China right now is figuring out how do we develop an online resource? How do we develop the website? How do we develop subsequent text messages or mailers or flyers that clearly articulate the value of using this program and also the social good that you're engaging in when you're actually using it? And so we're going to be leveraging social norm insights. We're going to be leveraging identity priming, like you are the type of person that recycles, right, um, as a way to actually encourage uh, usage. So this will require some front end changes to, again, the way that the website is uh, organized and the kinds of messages we use, and then also some stuff down the line, like how do we actually keep people engaged in the program once they're already signed up? Because there can be issues of retention and attrition down the line. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and so while we're on this environmental theme, let's move down to Ecuador. So Ecuador um, is working on this very interesting initiative called Green Crowds, and it's a uh, website that enables crowdfunding of environmental projects in Ecuador. And the website is set up, they've done a nice job with that, and now it's more of a question of how do we entice and encourage people to donate um, funding to these environmentally oriented projects in Ecuador. And here, um, you know, each, each one of these initiatives is unique, and each one is built around what's possible with regard to the data and the capability and the capacity in the IT. Um, in this particular case, we are also partnering with the United Nations Academic Impact Secretariat, and um, we're basically building a toolkit for um, professors in universities to enable them to test behavioral insights in their own classrooms. So imagine a situation where you've got a professor teaching social psychology or teaching behavioral economics or maybe even teaching experimental psychology. Wouldn't it be cool if their students could actually work on a real world project um, with real Getting an alien present. <laughs> we just set up a toolkit um, that makes that easy, you know, reduces the hassle factor for the professor, um, provides some example projects that can be utilized to encourage people to maybe test two different emails to see, you know, like who donates more money to the Green Crowds website. Um, our colleagues in Ecuador are going to be help us provide the data back to the instructors. So basically, everybody wins. You know, you've got. Um, increased funding, hopefully, for green crowds. You've got a way to test these behavioral insights, and you're engaging university professors and students in the SDGs, which, you know, I can tell you, being on campus at North Carolina State University, and also at the University of Cape Town, where my other appointment is, people want to engage with the Sustainable Development Goals um, on these campuses. The students are excited about it. The faculty are excited about it. Don't always know how, so there's one concrete way in which we can get them engaged. Um, Sure, sure, okay. yeah. Just to the extent that um, a lot of these, well, yeah, I just want to hear from all of you. <laughs> make sure we have enough time to make sure yeah, we see if there's a discussion. Speak, we can speak to any of these. Yeah, um, so if you have a specific question, I just want to make sure. Before that. open it up, let me just add yeah. one thing on that portfolio. Yeah. For the innovation facility, we support a number of champions and company offices in testing new ways of doing business. And over the last two years, supported over 100 initiatives. And those were our first points of contact, where we have people on the ground who want to stretch or test the envelope. And so we reached out to those innovation champions. Some of them have particularly worked with Babel Insights. Others were new to it, but they're like, hey, we have this, for example, app in China mm -hmm. on e-waste recycling. We want to improve it. Tell us how. Yeah. Work with us. So this is how this portfolio came together. It was like looking inside the innovation facility portfolio and then finding the right partners. And adding behavioral insights onto existing initiatives. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Ben. And I, I think another point is that in every instance, we're asking our country offices, what are the goals that you're already trying to solve? What are the problems that you're already after? Let us try to figure out what tools from behavioral science we can offer on the table that can help you get to those goals faster. So we don't bring like our own research agenda to the table. It's sort of a, like a a need basis, which is um, you've already probably got a set of tools in your toolkit to try to achieve X goal, but um, we would like to add another one. Floor is open for yeah. any questions. You got one right next to you. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, my name is Jose Cruz Osorio. I work in the governance and peace building cluster in the policy bureau here in UNDP. And uh, a lot of support we provide to governments, at least in my unit, uh, has to do with uh, public sector efficiency and effectiveness. Mm. Certainly, uh, you know, through the whole uh, 
uh, process of reinventing government uh, and, and all the various uh, models and approaches that have been tried. Now, one of the things that uh, certainly we notice is a lot of the, the uptake around the issue of um, uh, innovation labs um, and, and very much widely adopted and used. And my question is to understand a little bit then the, um, uh, you know, how you see the differences between the innovation labs and the behavioral insights. Uh, how do they complement or connect uh, each other? Uh, and just uh, to yeah. understand a little bit that uh, relationship. That's a great question. I mean, one, uh, we would like to consider ourselves part of the innovation team here <laughs> because I think the goal is to, the way that we see our role as part of uh, the innovation team is as I said earlier, introducing a new innovative tool or technique that might be underutilized currently at UNDP, um, that might be an additional tool that Malika and Ben and others can socialize with country offices as they go about doing their work. So to the extent that there's an innovation, innovation toolkit, I think the long-term goal, we were talking about this this morning, Ben, is to build capacity for these kinds of approaches in country offices across the globe. So when we work on a project with, say, Egypt, the final end goal is not having run an RCT, a randomized control trial with that group, or to have them adopt behavioral insights. It's for that team to actually have learned the methods and the research methods behind the intervention so that moving forward, they have this skill and they have this content knowledge that will allow them to apply behavioral insights to other programs and policies moving forward. And so I think that in many ways you can view this work as sort of a proof of concept effort where we're trying to show that these insights can in fact be applied to programs around the world, but that also our partners will then take that knowledge and that sh those shared resources and integrate it into their business as usual practice moving forward. But I do think you're uh, touching on too uh, something really important that you're seeing these trends towards you know innovation facilities and towards behavioral insights teams or whatever you want to call them. Um, and there is some overlap, but they're not exactly the same. Um, and it would be a shame to see them working in silos, right? Yeah. You know, and this actually is one of the first spaces that I've seen um, do this really well of bringing these two together, um, such that they draw from the strengths of, of the other approach. I just wanted to add to that. So what we're seeing at UNDP is for a lot of teams like we see in Bangladesh, we're seeing this in Egypt, where we have little mini innovation ecosystems. They, they were early adopters of testing out new approaches. Uh, they're the first to want to actually add a behavioral insights team on ground, locally. Mm -hmm. So Egypt is like, what would that look like in our context? Because we are testing new approaches. Yeah. We want to add this to our toolbox. Because things that we started testing, we're starting to mainstream that into, into uh, going beyond piloting. So that for us is uh, really interesting to see within our country offices and do and learn from them. Yeah. Um, it sounds to me like uh, a lot of this has been focused on programs and projects and how we how we're thinking about how we deliver these. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any discussion or thought given to? maybe looking inward at our own organization at UNDP and uh, using BNI to improve how, how we function from an operational level. How do we comply with our own policies? How do we make it you know, so that our country offices can, can work with them and it's usable and the connections between regional bureaus and HQ, things like that. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, it's a great like question. Outward, yeah, Laura, do you want to talk to some of the internal work and then? Sure, yeah, sure. So, it's a um, great question. So, yeah, there, there's been a fair amount of discussion about that at, within the Secretariat, I will say. Um, and um, I would almost say that that's the priority um, with respect to our support there at this point. Um, yeah. Um, and there, the nice thing about this multidisciplinary approach, is, as I mentioned before, is that you draw from the strengths of the different disciplines, um, and some are more or less relevant depending on the problem space at hand. But there are a lot of tools and techniques from industrial and organizational psychology that can be applied um, in that context. So this can um, involve scientific methods, for instance, to uh, define leadership, change-making leadership, like what does that mean, and not just what does that mean by somebody or another person's opinion, but how do you use scientific methods to understand, define, and validate change-making leadership, and then even measure leadership, um, such that you can define, identify the gaps between where leadership is at um, and where you want leadership to be, and then, again, scientifically design education and training programs to help fill those gaps. 
So um, you can certainly draw from these methods, I think, to address internal problems um, and internal challenges. And it just depends on where the priorities of any given agency are. But we have um, quite a demand for that. I would yeah. Think. One of the projects that we had discussed in the early days with Malika was actually finding ways to better design country solicitations for, for innovative proposals. So that's an example of an internal reform that would have amazing ripple effects down the line, right? If you can get folks in country offices to want to produce higher quality or more innovative proposals or to do them in a more timely manner, um, it's not as discreet as having like a distinct project going in a country, but I think the transcendent effects of making that kind of um, impact can be pretty large. Um, so that's sort of the space that we thought about it internally. So just to give you a, a quick uh, chop end, so Maya and Laurie are with uh, Behavioral Advisors for the UN Secretary General. They have a limited term appointment for about six to eight months, hopefully longer. And this is 50% of their time. So 50% of their time, they're with the White House doing their regular jobs. And then the other 50%... But both parties think that it's full time. They both so. think it's full time, right? You have my, my White House boss is not internalized, but this <laughs> is not happening. <laughs> this is on my calendar. And so while they're with the UN, the idea is they want to showcase does the UN have a space when working with behavioral insights? Is there a space that we can offer? Is there something that we can do with it? And so this is really a showcasing appointment. And so while they were with the UN, they thought, you know, since with the secretary, they haven't had an uh, engagement of working internally and with operations and HR, said, what about looking at the programming aspect? Who would be a good programming partner to have? And so that's what we sort of focused on. We had so many ideas. We're like, we would like to test exactly, as you said, sort of the gamut of the things that UNDP does, you know, from HR. And so we're just focusing on this because we basically have 25% of that time in real time uh, for the engagement. And we showcase, hopefully, um, at the GA uh, and see what we've learned and, and what next. I have a question about the East framing, from my understanding, is UK that was developed in the UK. Mm -hmm. Is it as applicable for the development context? Would there be, you know, and I think from a UNDP perspective, I'm leaving a bit behind, like the equity focus for me is maybe missing, and all the studies you talk about, you know, the RCT is the increase. Has anybody looked at the distributional effect? Like for HIV, was there a widening of, say, you know, you first you assume that people have a lot of phones, but from a sort of equity perspective, has there been a second analysis to see if distributions, like if inequities widen through some behavioral insights? And I wonder if the UK or US context is unique, or if you're finding that it's not. I think there are going to be some uniquenesses, and I think um, we've got a lot to learn um, as these behavioral insights approaches um, get applied much more broadly. Um, the, one of the meetings that we participated in um, in Geneva a few weeks ago was um, a behavioral insights research committee that had just been launched um, around the environment, uh, environmental issues, sustainable consumption and production and whatnot. Um, and this was by the Green Growth Knowledge Platform, which is kind of overseen by uh, UNEP, OECD, World Bank. Uh, but those, those discussions were very much at the table, and we had a very international um, table uh, sitting there. And I think a lot of attention is going to be paid there, but elsewhere as well, to figure out which insights translate and which don't. The good news is that because testing is so part and parcel um, with this approach, um, we've got a way to learn along the way what's mm -hmm. working, what's not. And I think that would be helpful. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, now I agree with you on you know, the importance of um, including behavioral insights into you know, projects that we develop, et cetera. Just from an operational, practical perspective, does, what does this imply for you and country teams, for example, which are putting together projects? Would that require them to work with behavioral advisors or research institutes to carry out these uh, assessments uh, during the process of elaborating a new project, for example? What does it imply from an operational, practical perspective? Yeah, well, I think, um, um, UNDP will be in the best position to answer the mm -hmm. question of what is and isn't going to be required. Uh, but there is one thing that I want to pick up on uh, that you said is it's a great idea to bring in behavioral insights advisors at the beginning of a project. Um, and, and, and you know we we can hop on board midway through as well. You know, and, and there are different things that we can add um, to the conversation. 
But the nice thing about having those conversations at the beginning of the project is that you actually can put good measures in place to enable you to do tasks that might not be possible if you thought of this midway through. Can I add also, mm -hmm. just a second that we have from the beginning of a project, what we saw working with a number of country offices, the conversations with Maya and Laurie, is that the devil is in the detail because to speak with authority what works in terms of an intervention, you need to have a good baseline and then measure your results, ideally with a counterfactual with a randomized control trial setup. But many of our colleagues who said, yeah, let's work with behavioral insights, mm -hmm. they didn't have baseline data on the things they're trying to achieve and not the capacities to either develop a baseline or, nor to measure going forward. It's not really new in the piece culture or like project setup. So having it from the get-go makes a huge difference, I think. It wasn't easy for us actually to find entry points where you can set up RCTs. And they don't only work in RCTs, behavioral insights intervention, but it's much better to have a number of them so you can speak that's Unipi's, or one of Unipi's that's problem, right. you know, with authority, oh, we know what works. Mm -hmm. Welcome. I'm so sorry, I've actually got to run across the street for a meeting, but Lori's going to field all other questions sure. <laughs> coming in. But I just wanted to thank all of you guys again. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Maya. Thank you. Thank you. The examples so far provided are um, mostly examples of specific projects. Right. So I'm wondering how you would apply behavioral insight when you are dealing with really big global issues. Would you tackle big global issues by a step-to-step -step approach, assuming that micro behavior, once upon a time, uh, translates into macro change? Or mm -hmm. how would you tackle that? Yeah, and so um, one comment, and then I might ask you a follow-up question. I think, um, generally speaking, um, sometimes behavioral insights is not the answer. You know, sometimes it is um, it is regulation. You know, sometimes it's law. Um, so you know, with some of the big global global issues, um, keeping in mind that you know, doing that diagnosis up front, like Maya was talking about, and figuring out when is it a behavioral issue and when isn't it, and sometimes it isn't. Um, and so trying to parse that out up front. Um, but do you have a specific example in mind when? Take the whole global issue of climate change and yeah. specific consumption patterns, which is a huge, 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 huge yeah. issue. I, how to tackle it? Yeah, because clearly there are behavioral components to that, right? Although that's not the only component. Um, I think it's exactly what you said: is that you um, then drill down into like the specific um, issues within that um, that are priority areas for you. So maybe it's consumption. And then you drill down further into, you know, are you trying to get people to um, reuse their towels in a hotel room? Are you going to try to get people to, you know, ride a bike to work more often? And so basically drilling down, and there are many, many behaviors that contribute to that, but figuring out which behaviors are the most important to change to achieve those broader aims. And then once you've got it down to, you know, what is the behavioral um, bottleneck, as we say sometimes, then you can design interventions around it. But I mean, don't you think when you look at the last 30, 40 years of interventions that we have done worldwide, either by climate change conferences or by other interventions to take a climate change without having any major impact, don't you think that something is fundamentally wrong in our approach or in our models? There's room for improvement. Yeah, <laughs> there's room for improvement. But I, I, yeah, I think that um, that behavioral analysis often has not been applied, you know, in, in the past X number of years. And so bringing that in, again, alongside, because I don't want to suggest that, that behavioral insights is the panacea for all the world's problems. I mean, it, it needs to be inserted in the context of regulations and laws and other very important drivers to behavior as well, right? Um, but, but I'd say there's definitely room for improvement, but we've not seen a lot of behavioral insights approach apply to these issues in the years past, and I hope we're going to see more going forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Laurie. Just to, to build on what you said, it's not a panacea, of course. It is one of the main things that we as an organization can think of applying to our projects and program, particularly as we try to get a little more uh, disciplined around measurement of results and then ask the question, what if we were to take a different tack and be um, very deliberate about it in the way we measure it through uh, different parallel tracks uh, and so on. It's, it's not behavioral insight in and of itself is, is probably, it's a very old science. Um, it's what people call marketing to some extent, right, in the private sector. I'm interested in that dichotomy of thinking between private sector sphere and public sector. 
the private sector is selling a product, and so is the government in many cases. So why not employ the same marketing techniques of making convenience uh, where you locate that particular product uh, or, or you know the letters, examples you gave us. So in a way, it's it's it's, it's all science almost, but, but the application to, to in our context, I think, it's where it becomes I think quite interesting for us now to to invest time and resources and our own knowledge and build up our own. Uh, knowledge of what 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 can be done, uh, with of course no prejudice to the fact there are very there are experts that come in and can advise uh, can, can advise us on this. Uh, but it's it's not in, in and of itself. I don't think it's, it's necessarily what's going to uh, address these overarching huge uh, huge issues. But in terms of our project uh, effectiveness, I think that's where our impact can be improved by bringing in some of these techniques from the get go uh, and and hard wiring them into the design phase. And I think, you know, when we when it comes to some of those big issues, what we have found collectively is that asking people to make big sacrifices doesn't seem to be working, right? And so figuring out um, how to build policies that go with the grain of humanity. Um, so instead of asking people to make sacrifices, it's framing things in such a way that um, the choice that you're hoping for, it actually is the most attractive, easiest, hassle-free choice. I had a question uh, regarding the analysis of the conceptually the behavior analysis. How far you take it? You just do that at individual level? Do you actually take into account a bigger study on, on aspects related with the bigger culture or religious uh, elements, uh, aspects related with incentives, uh, related with uh, power relations, which mark a lot how people behave in a society? How far do you go in that analysis? What's in your toolbox for that? Right. Um, so, and tell me if this doesn't answer the question. I mean, typically, the in in a very typical study where we're using a randomized control trial, um, we'll start um, by randomly assigning people to two or three different conditions. Um, oftentimes, we'll block um, on a certain variable. So, if we want to make sure that these conditions are relatively equal with respect to certain key factors that we think are important. Yet we still want to stay true to randomization. Then we'll block on certain, you know, demographics or whatever the case may be. Uh, but then after that, it's you know comparing those groups statistically to see you know if there's any difference in uptake or outcome or whatever the case may be among them. Then I think that's where this partnership becomes really important because then it's a question of interpreting those results in this bigger political, cultural, environmental context. And that's where it's super important that we're having this collaboration with Malika and Ben and UNDP and our project partners because they assist with that bigger picture sense making of this result within the broader context. Okay. Ben? For example, there was an interest by the gender team to look in potential gender based violence or just at, or potential of behavioral insights to address gender based violence. And we drafted a proposal. Not with Laurie Maya, but with the UK Behavioral Insights team. And they're looking for partners. But there, it's very much you dive into um, exploration phase and see exactly those power relations, the, the salient norms, mm -hmm. and like points of entry where you can change behavior. That's not going to address the root causes, but it's really aiming at having some interventions in terms of um, prevention and also response that improve on both ends. Yeah, or um, in Bangladesh, uh, several of the projects that have been uh, proposed, you know, before um, it got to us, those on the ground, you know, went out and um, you know did a lot of groundwork with respect to figuring out the reality in that context of what bus ridership means. Or there were a couple of other projects as well. Um, these, or they, the UDCs, um, uh, Union Access. Digital Centers. Yeah, the yeah. Access Information Centers in rural areas. Right, where they, you know, went out and did, you know. Um, almost like a sociologist in some ways, like, you know, figured out the actual on the ground context and then brought that back to us and said, okay, like, you know, here's the reality. Now let's design around this reality in this context. I think there was one more question. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Shall we take two more? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I was going to ask, like, um, what can we do to make this part of UNDP's work? <laughs> Bernardo, but maybe this is a question uh, more, more for you. Yeah. Like, uh, what can be done to really get this sort of advice to our country offices, who can then use this type of tips? 
to the government when they're designing and implementing each program. And you can come and tell them that you can improve efficiency uh, impacts with simple, little, costless uh, uh, tricks. So, where do you see this going? Well, I mean, just on a general perspective, and, and I think many other people in the room would have a similarly uh, you know, uh, qualified opinion. But um, there's two things we can do. One is internally, of course, operationally, there's a lot of potential for this. The very reason we do this innovation series talks is to expose and, 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 and try to inspire also other colleagues to, to what's coming down the line and how they can then take it back to, in their own uh, offices and, and, and think whether there's, there's room for, for applying that. Um, what we heard from college from procurement, I think there's a lot of room there, and tendering documentation, how do we reduce the level and the rate of errors, whereby the ACP, the procurement committee, then has to reject certain things because of procedural errors. There's probably something can be done, and we could make our operation more efficient. Think of our own performance, uh, staff performance documentation. How do we get people to fill these out in time instead of six months afterwards? It's a bit of a, there's a lot of that that can be done on the basis of, uh, of behavioral insights, that, of which we have plenty. Um, but in terms of, uh, I think you, 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 you were spot on when you mentioned the fact that we need to move to, a, to, a, to, a, to the aspiration of, of, of offering this as a service to, our, to, to different governments. We have this unique privileged position of working in different countries, different contexts, different textures. We, we could really, um, uh, many other organizations do have that, but at the same time, we have a privileged relationship with some governments where they have the insights. How do we build and how do we see if a specific instance of behavioral insight will translate in another context? And I think that's What's, what's unique about it. Um, as you know, we have a, um, uh, our innovation team has a number of advisors in, in the field, certainly very active, in, say in the Asia Pacific context where you work, we see the benefit and value of that, of bringing that, uh, sort of evangelizing almost around some of these techniques. Um, I do think that it takes deliberate investment by the organization uh, at the program level, at the project level, at the training level to get, uh, to get our ability to, to, to make the most of some of these uh, new techniques, uh, as, as for all things. Of course, but um, but if we're able to identify a number of, I mean, perhaps not all of these ongoing projects uh, and activities will pan out in terms of showing the, the value of that particular insights. But if we get to 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 showcase and identify some 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 real, you know, nuggets of of, of, um, of, of impact, then I think we're in a good position through the machinery we have, through the knowledge sharing we have, the networks we have, uh, we're well placed. I also think that. Um, uptake uh, without leadership and management uh, involved by executives, senior executives, it t tends to be a lot more sluggish and a lot more random. So if uh, I think it's important that uh, they, our senior managers, are fully on board of what we do. And I think we're, we're well placed. We, we, we briefed Magdi this morning, so he's well aware of, of the good work uh, that um, our, our colleagues are doing and, and the time that they're dedicating to, to UNDP. So I think that, to me, that's the first step. Uh, anyone in the communications business, I suppose, around the room is also well placed to advertise further, broadcast, and show, and really join hands around some of these, uh, uh, because we really, could, you, you know, uh, I think it's sort of a comparative advantage that we may all be. But uh, I think it's good news that we have such a uh, good section, cross section of the organization here. Again, yeah, operationally, we have applications for this programmatically, and uh, ideally as a, as a service as we look to position your NDP in, into this next 15 years of a very sophisticated, crowded type of work that we need to do to stay relevant. We, we, we do civil registration, voters registration, electoral stuff uh, in different contexts. What works in one place, what doesn't, what, what could make you work better? And once we have that, are we able to sell it to a different government? I, I use sell it not in a mercantile sort of sense, but in, in the sense of bringing it back to what they do. Uh, if we are, uh, and, and potentially it's stuff that can be of use to, um, to develop um, in a developed context as well. I mean, that's some of the beauty of what UNDP does. That it's no longer a situation where we have to you know, learn and sort of trickle down. In fact, uh, because of the technology penetration and so on, something that we learned in, uh, say, Mozambique could well be of use on the behavioral side. Um, since you know human nature tends to be fairly consistent, uh, it could, could also be of use, uh, say, in Canada. So just to quickly add to that, the reason that Maya and Lori are here as behavior advisors to the UN is to do that showcasing. So the question is, you know, once we do that learning, as Venado talked about across the initiatives here at the Secretariat, 
um, does the UN want to set up like a behavioral nudge unit like they've done with big data and global funds, you know? So what would be the next steps there? So that's what sort of this testing ground is now that we have agenda 2030. Everyone's like, what can this mean and how do we really deliver on this big agenda? So we're all waiting to see what happens come fourth quarter uh, with the results. My question is on the sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, how do you keep track of the changes and make sure that the qualities <coughs> actually last in the long run? Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, that I would say that that's a frankly a shortcoming of a lot of the research that's done in this space. Uh, not all of it, um, but the very best research, of course, is going to use this randomized control trial that we've talked about in many cases, um, but then track the results over time to make sure that, you know, this nudge um, persists. And there are some really good example studies where, where they're doing that. Um, but it's a balance between the reality of resource constraints and um, data collection capability um, versus what we know is the best science. But there again, having that question early on, right, enables um, one to track over time what these results are. So, for example, um, in the uh, federal space, um, one of the projects I'm working on has to do with employment. Um, and from the beginning of that project, um, it's enabling and, and helping unemployed people get back to work more quickly. Um, we put the framework in place to pull data, you know, not just two months out, four months out, but six months, 12 months, and track over time to see what these results look like. I think that's um, a real need and something to think hard about at the beginning design phase of projects. I'd say we conclude. Nice. And <laughs> thanks so much, Lori. Thank you, everybody.